Hi, welcome to Mental Health Matters. I'm Shannon Elliott. According to former Surgeon General David Satcher, stigma is the most formidable obstacle to future progress in the arena of mental illness and mental health. We often address stigma in our shows, but today we will go in depth into how it is impacting people's daily lives and legislation. Joseph Robinson is a program manager at the California Mental Health Services Authority. He has a master's degree in social work and has extensive experience in community organizing, administration, and planning. Kenneth Cozy Arrington is the Outreach Coordinator for Peers, an Oakland nonprofit dedicated to mental health. He educates the community on mental health recovery and stigma. He's also an HIV AIDS activist. Welcome Joseph and welcome Cozy. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Joseph, can you tell us what stigma is and why it's such a critical issue for discussion? So one, a key element uh, for stigma is, um, is, is shame and isolation that uh, oftentimes it, uh, the, it, and the result is that people don't talk about what's going on and it adds to that isolation. We know that community heals and isolation kills. So it's critical that we focus attention, that we talk about it. And again, I'm so thankful for the opportunity today to, to talk about stigma directly. So what does stigma look like in mental health? <clears throat> I'll tell you first what it looked like in my family. My um, <clears throat> mother had uh, bipolar disorder and had very severe symptoms and was hospitalized a dozen and a half times in a seven year period before she took her life. My father uh, died 12 years later. We didn't talk about my mother's and my family. We didn't talk about my mother's illness. We didn't talk about her hospitalizations. Uh, and subsequently, after she died, we didn't talk about her illness. We didn't talk about the symptoms. And we didn't talk about her suicide. Um, so in my family, it meant a lot of secrecy and a lot of shame and a lot of sort of tension in, um, in, in how that impacts the relationship and how it re impacts sort of just the, the entire system. I think more broadly, and that's not unusual, uh, more broadly, it, it impacts access to service. We know that the sooner someone, and this is true for for any health condition, that this, the sooner one seeks support in whatever that means. So it, you know, it could mean seeking a mental health uh, services through a mental health professional, support through clergy or the church, or wh however one gets support. <clears throat> the, the sooner someone reaches out for support, the better the, the outcome in terms of continued success. So what often happens is people don't talk about it. So again, what happened in my family? So for years, and that becomes sort of perpetual, and with that, the, uh, the opportunity for, um, for symptom relief is delayed, and the uh, prognosis for continued uh, recovery is harder. It still happens, and it, you know, it happens all the time but our, our outcomes are better if someone seeks support sooner. And I was really struck by what you said about your mother and your family relationships. Mm -hmm. The stigma not only interfered with her seeking treatment, but it sounds like it really affected your family relationships to this, to this day. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Cozy, how have you personally experienced mental health stigma? Oh, I've experienced, well, I self-stigmatize. I have found that I self-sabotage, self-stigmatize. When you have so many different stigmas, you know, like those Petruska dolls that one inside the other. So I have like the stigma of being African American male. I have the stigma of being gay. I have the stigma of being an ex offender. I have the stigma of having HIV. I have the stigma of a mental illness. So once I'm buried underneath all of these different layers of stigma, somewhere in there I'm being bombarded by all of these stigmas every day. And um, so because of that, I tend to self-stigmatize. And I'm learning now only how to embrace that and rise above that as I have all of these other um, situations that cause the stigma to begin with. Would you say that you, your self-stigmatization is stronger or the external stigma from other people is stronger in your particular case? 
Probably self-stigma. I'm my own worst critic in all of my professional endeavors, you know. Um, I don't really, I can tell people, to, if you don't like it, you know what to do. You know, that's my attitude now. You don't have to like me, but you will respect me and you will hopefully gain a better understanding of what's going on with me if you would only open your heart, your mind, and your soul to be open and honest and accepting. Why do each of you think stigma exists? Hmm. I, I think at its base is, is fear um, and uh, not understanding and um, the fear of, of the unknown. Uh, judgment, a lot of sort of expectation, sort of social uh, norm. And in, in some ways, our country uh, values independence, but we also really value staying within sort of social constructs. So there's sort of that dichotomy um, that you can can go a little far out, but not too far out. And when you do that, there's there's a lot of, of, of fear. Um, so I think at, at its base, it's it's in, in fear. Yeah, a lot of fear because people um, they don't understand what you may be going through. And they always want to say that person is always somebody else, but never themselves. When oftentimes they need to really look in the mirror because they will find that they are experiencing pretty much some of the same symptoms even as this person is exhibiting. Only, what do we do? We hide it. We hide it. We don't want to accept the truth of ourselves. So how can we accept the truth of someone else? The idea being if we put all the attention on someone else, yes, we don't have it, to look inside ourselves. It doesn't take it off of me. Right. So we've been talking about stigma. What's the difference between stigma and discrimination, and where can these occur? Well, this stigma can occur anywhere. Um, the difference between stigma and prejudice is what one does with that stigma if they act upon it, how they might treat you uh, if they keep you from being housed for instance, if they deny you medical care, for instance, if they don't listen to you when you go to your doctor, for instance, because they've looked at your chart first and they've seen a label or a name, so automatically they, they put you in a box and with a whole lot of assumptions, uh, that's the difference between stigma and discrimination. And, and you can't really tease them apart. I mean, you really cannot talk about one, one without, without the, the other. other. So, you know, it's, it's the set of beliefs and then it's how that, their impact and of how those beliefs impact the way that we treat ourselves and the way that we treat others and the way, the way that, that we're treated. So, yes. you, you know, you asked about what does it look like in mental health? Hmm. What it looks like often is not being trusted by healthcare professionals because they see this diagnosis. It means limited access to housing uh, and other sort of community opportunities. So, it, you know, it really does have a tangible impact. How would each of you say that stigma in mental health compares to other types of stigma in society? <clears throat> hmm. Well, I thought that um, even though mental health has been around since man has been around, and take for instance the HIV, which has been around for like 30, let's say 35 years, okay. I was thinking that um, that stigma that came with being HIV positive was a hell of a lot more devastating than that of having a mental health issue. And I wonder sometimes how much having these other conditions contributed to my lack of mental health. Absolutely, and I know sometimes, I mean, we don't really stigmatize people who have, it depends on, I guess it could depend on the physical disease, but you know, if someone might be struggling with a physical illness or they break their leg, we don't, as a society, generally stigmatize them, but we seem to if they're struggling with, you know, a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> but we do, we certainly have with other illnesses, particularly in the beginning. So Cozy mm -hmm. talks about HIV. You know, HIV, we have much to learn from the HIV community mm -hmm. because all those stigmas certainly still exist. It's nothing like it was You're in right. the 80s. Yeah. I mean, they, they, that community has come such a long way, and we all together have come such a long way in our understanding uh, and the lack uh, or the decrease of stigma that now exists. 
breast cancer uh, is another great example of, you know, cancer was <clears throat> scary. It was unknown and it wasn't talked about. And, and now, you know, you see a pink ribbon or, you, you know, sometimes even pink, and that's mm -hmm. the association. There's a lot of community support and a lot of openness around talking about it, which makes a difference in access to treatment and, and seeking treatment. So, uh, so we have a lot to learn from other communities have, who, as you mentioned, you know, mental health's been around for a long time, and I don't think we've made the progress mm -hmm. with decreasing the stigma re related to mental health that other communities, other physical health care communities have. And it's interesting he should mention the cancer. People don't run away from cancer. If I tell you mm -hmm. I have cancer, <clears throat> you're not going to run away. You're going to run toward me. You're going to embrace me and try to... Um, encourage me and heal me and soothe me in any way you can. I tell you I have mental health illness, you're going to back up, you're going to want to disassociate yourself from me, you are going to begin to talk about me, be, you know, whisper and do all these things. So that's a major difference. Some um, illnesses people embrace, they accept, others they are less likely to do so. It's it's a great it's a great point and it not only happens socially where you get that sort of retreat, it happens in at, at, at jobs. On that your job. within yeah, the mental health community, I've heard from another a uh, number of mental health professionals who are unwilling to disclose their their symptoms or their history in fear of lack of professional respect or credibility, yes. even within our own community. So talk about self-stigma. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you're less than. Joseph, you mentioned we could learn some lessons from the breast cancer movement and the HIV movement in terms of progressing past stigmas. What can mental health learn, um, the leaders in this movement, and how far do we have to go, in your opinion? We have a ways to go. I, I've uh, noticed in the last year that there's been more adult and responsible conversations uh, on sort of the talking heads following uh, tragedies involving someone who reportedly has some some symptoms of, of mental health, some mental health symptoms. <clears throat> um, the Aurora, Colorado shooting was uh, maybe 15 months ago now. It happened <clears throat> at midnight on a Friday. That Sunday morning, each of the Talking Heads show had folks on that were talking about gun control. And it was, in many ways, I mean, I guess th th there's a connection. The point is, is that they had an organized message and they were set and they are prepared for any opportunity to get Use their the perspective platform. out. And that's what we have to learn, that we, there are a couple of things. I mean, so that's one, that we as a community can organize a message and every opportunity that we get, so both, you know, any sort of exposure. So if it's following a tragedy or if it's following or in May for Mental Health Matters Month or in October for the, the Mental Health, uh, I think it's Mental Health Illness Week that Congress mm -hmm. has designated, there's a, a, a a international mental health uh, day in October as well. Any of those opportunities to get the message out and for it to be organized, and much, much like this, but letters to the editor, showing up at city council meetings, showing up at school boards. It, it's time that we get outside of our mental health silos and we get our message out. The other piece is I envision a day where you can go to the grocery store and when you're checking out, they say, would you like to donate $1 mm -hmm. to, to mental health? That will go such a long way in our not retreating. I imagine a day that on the other side of my grocery bag, the one I purchase, of course, because I left it in the car, <laughs> of that it has, uh, you know, I would love for it to be each my matters, but it's in the any uh, awareness building about mental health and us getting our different message out because there is, there's messaging out there that is very different than the message of mental health, uh, mental wellness and recovery. Mm -hmm. And I think we, 
uh, need to do a more coordinated, organized effort in getting that message out. And by the same token, if we could only get the media to not sensationalize every single bad thing that happens and one of the first thing that comes out of their mouth, this person had <clears throat> mental illness. I hear you, but that's not, I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, oh, I know, realism. You know, they're, they're, sensationalism sells. That's what, it would be fantastic. Yeah. But their business is to sell eyeballs. So, right. you know, that's what sell, sells eyeballs. Our business is to get the messages of, of strength and recovery and wellness out there. And I think we've got to do it 10 to 1. Mm. I think we've got to, the way, that, the, the way that we combat it is not by saying, hey, that's not true or, you know, stop doing that. It's to say there are 10 other people who are in recovery and who used to have symptoms, severe symptoms. They, they used to have hear voices and you know what? Now they're fully employed, mm -hmm. they're socially engaged, they're involved in their community. That's the message that we get out. It's gonna be harder because it's, you know, that isn't, yeah, that doesn't sell the positive. same way. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> positive. right. Yeah. But we need to be more comfortable with sharing that message and finding those opportunities to get that, to message, get that out. message out. I think out. that's how we, and it's not even really combat, we, we counter it. Mm. How would each of you say culture plays a role in mental health stigma? The literature is mixed on the, the, the impact. Um, Cal Mesa, the California Mental Health Services Authority uh, lead evaluator is Rand Corporation, and they've done some recent studies about the first uh, the first years of, of funding of Cal Mesa funding and the impact of culture, and it's somewhat mixed. Um, even their lit reviews, um, one one thing they they do feel very confident about is that within the Asian American community, they feel like they what their literature has shown is that stigma is the highest. So what that means is that someone who identifies as Asian American may be less likely, and the literature is clear, on seeking services, that it takes mm -hmm. longer and they seek uh, services. But the other piece is the discrimination piece. So if, if it's a business or a, a residential or building, um, apartment complex, that's owned by someone, you're more likely to have discrimination based on that, that stigma within the community. So I think what we do is really target message that we, uh, rather than sort of this, you know, Euro-focused, uh, middle-class-focused message that we spend more time in community and target messages that are fitting for individual communities. Well, um, culturally, in the African American community, as far as I know, it's like one of those things we just yeah. kind of not talk about. It's yeah. the big elephant in the room. Not only is it the elephant, it's the big pink elephant in the room, yeah. but still, it's not, it's not there. You don't want to talk about it. You want to probably hide those individuals who um, would be a source of embarrassment mm -hmm. and shame for your family. Um, it's not talked about. One of those very difficult conversations that never take place. There's organized effort now, so you know, focused, targeted message. There's organized effort to talk about mental health within the faith community, within the African American yeah. faith community. That's so that's exactly it. Now. You know, is yeah. really how do how do we how do we reach folks? Um, I think we have to be somewhat cautious, though, of not. Um, simplifying and you know you you identified being part we're all three identified with a number of communities mm -hmm. and so f too often we're sort of uh, pointed out as just being just being gay or just being black or just being someone living with HIV and we're all of those things mm -hmm. and it's really hard to know and it's y the only way you know it is through individual contact of what is the most, you know, how someone identifies the most and how that changes over time as well. So, um, so it's important, um, yet people are, we're all individuals and it's really important to check in with someone individually. That's a really great point. What have each of you found in your own experiences to be the best methods of busting mental health stigma? Oh, well, I'm, I have the perfect job outreach coordinator. Because of what I do in my other career, I'm an entertainer. 
So um, my group, whenever we have performed lately, we wear the green ribbon. So when you're before hundreds of people and you have this symbol, <coughs> it immediately opens the door and people are curious and they want to know. And I find that to be a very good way to open the door to that conversation. Whereas um, if you're, I'm out there just on the street by myself or whatever, trying to do this outreach, it would be much more difficult. But because of the position that I'm in and my ability to reach hundreds of people at a time, I think that is an awesome, amazing opportunity for me to have. So and you're saying if you have an audience anyway, is it? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. When, um, when Each Mind Matter started uh, just over a year ago, we were uh, picking out furniture and we went to, to, uh, to get chairs and uh, we found lime green chairs. <laughs> and we were, um, my colleague and I were just giddy because we pulled out the business cards and it was the exact, yes. because it's, very, it's a very technical color. I mean, they can give you the exact code of this lime green. There are mm -hmm. lots of variations of lime green. Mm -hmm. So we were giddy that we found these lime green chairs. And we were sort of like so silly that the clerk asked, what, you know, are you guys opening a business? What's going on? And, and we said, yeah. And then we started talking to each other. And I, uh, it was probably just even later that day, I said, goodness, that's the missed opportunity. That, mm -hmm. that, that I am committed and prepared to never let a missed opportunity like that pass. pass. That that's that's my charge. Not only as as a professional, it's my charge as as um, as being part of a social justice movement. Mm -hmm. So when I walked in this morning, the person where you sign in downstairs says, "I haven't seen the lime green ribbon. What is that for?" Mm -hmm. And I was able to to give a different message about mental wellness and recovery mm -hmm. than what she'll see on the news. Exactly. How does an individual's disclosure of their own mental health condition change public attitudes and stigmatizing attitudes? Do you find that it helps or hurts and why? Mm. Like we already said, you can't tell your boss or you can't tell certain people um, about your condition for fear of recrimination. And, and we all need to, you know, it, let it begin with me, right? And when one person does it, then a few more, mm -hmm. that there is a movement underway to be more uh, forthright, the, you know, thanks to voters in California in the Mental Health Services Act. I mean, there are, there's movement towards um, more openness and more disclosure. Um, so I think it helps because it, you know, we're all looking for connection. So when you talk about what's really going on with, when I talk about what's really going on with me, we connect by hearts. I mean, I know I'm gonna, you know, I live in San Francisco and I know it's gonna be like a little, um, um, hokey pokey or whatever, but um, that we can we connect as people. So when I take that risk and I talk about what's really going on with me, my experience has been that I get responded to in that in that way. Um, now there, you know, my so my lime green story is very different than uh, in, depending on person and location. Mm -hmm. So downstairs, she's not looking for my life history. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? She's, she's got people to, so it's, it's brief. Um, so the messaging, uh, the messaging matters and there's, there's opportunities to disclose more personal information or family history mm -hmm. uh, depending on the, 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 the situation and the person. So speaking of messaging, Cozy, how important would you say language is when it comes to changing attitudes about mental health? Language is very important. And I believe that that dialogue, that language has to begin with the individual. Um, it has to begin with oneself. That way one will know what is acceptable from others. And if not, how to educate someone else about how to use proper language. I know you told me, you know, that you sometimes check yourself when you say, oh, I'm being cuckoo or something like mm -hmm. that. Tell me, tell me why you do that and how important that is to check yourself and to sort of check other people when they use that kind of language. Well, I know that I used to see people and say, oh, that person's crazy or, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
um, really not knowing how much if that person were to hear me say that or how it affects even the people around you they they jump on the bandwagon oh okay he's crazy okay he's crazy okay blah 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 and, and besides the personal level um, you know we're recognizing it um, more more in, in, in publicly uh, that there's a bill uh, making its way through the legislature the California legislature this year sponsored by uh, Chesbro who who's going in in the bill uh, intends to change language in statute, old language. Mm. So just last year, recently, there was a similar bill that took out mental retardation. Mm. Terms that we don't use mm -hmm. anymore that, you know, that are outdated and stigmatizing, and now we know. So it's sort of like, once you know, you try to do better. And right. none of us are perfect, and we're going to slip up. But once we know that that could be hurtful to someone, then we try to do better, and so we do it on a personal level. And I'm really, you know, so pleased that the California legislators, as legislators, is that. recognizing mm -hmm. that and addressing that. That's great. Well, thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Cozy, for joining thank me today. You. Best of luck in your work, and I look forward to following your careers. Thank you. Each Mind Matters is a collection of statewide initiatives in California that include stigma and discrimination reduction, suicide prevention, and student mental health. Learn more at eachmindmatters.org. To learn more about mental health stigma and how California plans to address it, check out the California Strategic Plan on Reducing Mental Health Stigma and Discrimination. You can find it on the Cal Mesa website at calmesa.org. Stories of Recovery is a video series featuring inspiring and stigma-busting stories of mental health recovery. You can watch online at peersnet.org. To get involved with the Alameda County Social Inclusion Campaign, a local countywide effort to end mental health stigma, visit peersnet.org. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.